breakouts. There are four different breakouts. And we're going to hear now what the facilitators heard from you all. You know, what were you, what were the, uh, the kind of uh, oh, turning points and what were the, uh, the key words that they heard from you in, in, in the breakouts that maybe you didn't have time or, or the opportunity to bring out here. So let's start off first one. Let me see who's going to, who wants to start? Bo, why don't you start off first? We're going to start? Okay. We're, we're going to do it as a team. Okay. Right. That's fine. Tag team. Okay. Tag team. That's good. Uh, okay. So one of the first topics we talked about is from the first session. It was, um, did the pendulum swing too far one way, right? And we almost got everyone to hold up their hand, didn't we? Yes, we did. So we didn't have a very kind of, how do you say, a heterogeneous group there. <laughs> so, we so, so it became a question of how far has it swung further than it should have swung. Exactly right. And then also somebody brought up, it depended what industry it was too. Right, right? that was right. Yeah, we got Ron Laurie to, uh, willing to keep his hand down for a second with a caveat. Where's Ron? He ran, okay. He ran so out, okay. So that was one of the things. Um, <coughs> uh, another thing we were talking about was uh, PTAB and uh, $250,000. It was kind of yes. a steep estimate for some startup companies to go into. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, one of the other topics we were talking about was PTAB. You know, did it have a positive impact or not? And then we were also talking about the $250,000. Was it a big sum for a small startup? Uh, to take under, right? That was one of the th topics we were talking about. And I think, yeah, once you, once you see that things have swung, then you start to talk about those specific issues there instead of has it not or swung. And if you have people on the one side of the, more people on one side of the debate, of course, it's easier to, to, to try to nuance everything. But when, you, when everyone kind of agrees that it swung too far, then you start to talk about what are those specific issues, right? And one of them is the PTAB, which I think Marshall said was, uh, we're not supposed to use names, are we? No, we're not. Uh, but I wrote them all down, no? No one, no, one <laughs> no one knows who Marshall is anyway, so it's, uh, but that it was, uh, had some, wasn't necessarily fulfilled what it was intended to do, but things take time to work their way through. That's true. And we also talk about uh, how the U.S. grew since the patent system, right? If um, companies would not exist if there wasn't patents at all, right? So we kind of chatted about that a little bit. And who was it okay. about, about the awareness, right? It's, uh, patents are kind of, or the IP is relatively ubiquitous. And it's a little bit, I, I'm in Europe nowadays, so when you talk about the European Union, people say, oh, we don't need the European Union, it's only about these things. And then, of course, once you leave the U European Union, like the Brexit, you start to think, shit, there's a lot of stuff related to European Union that's kind of, I didn't think about that's kind of important. And I think that's the same thing right. when it comes with intellectual property. You hear the little stuff on the surface, that's bad, but you don't understand that it's actually been going on, you know, for a long, long time, and it's really immensely important. But this part is so ubiquitous, it's hard to describe, you know, fish can't really describe water. They've been in it all the time. Many layers, yeah. And then, <clears throat> how do we solve the awareness? And we said it was kind of a multi-pronged approach, just like your statement. Um, one of the other things we talked about was uh, China and our IP uh, system is very strong. That was the perceived notion that we had in a in our little conference room. But I think we would probably could split 50-50 if we agreed on that or not. Yeah, so every time we talked about, you know, is there a lack of awareness, the general consensus would be yes. Has the pendulum swung too far? Yes. But when we probed a little bit and pushed a little bit on the other side, they're like, well, these people kind of know what's going on, and these people kind of know. And well, in some circumstances, maybe it hasn't swung far in this way. So. I think that's really at the heart of the issue, is that when you really start to dig in, the patent system, as we say, was designed from the beginning in a time that was much, much simpler. I mean, what Robert Merger says when you used to, what was it he said, when you put technology in a bag and shook it in the beginning, it made noise. Not anymore. So it's, it's too complicated now to handle as a kind of coherent system. It's so many different um, caveats, I would say. That's mm -hmm. what we talked about, wasn't it? That was another thing we talked about, too. And then we also talked about a competitive advantage. Um, does, do we have a patent system uh, to give the U.S. a competitive advantage, right? So if we are going to, uh, how would you say, if China is perceived as having a better IP, stronger IP system, how does the U.S. get it back? What's their competitive advantage? Right. So that was another issue we talked and about. Who, and who advocates that, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we talk about who advocates on behalf of the U.S. Who... who 
most people advocate on behalf of their company or their organization. Who advocates on behalf of the U.S.? Who would be a credible source of information about IP, about being good for the U.S.? And then, yeah, how important is the patent system going forward? Will the patent system always be important? We all agreed yes, you know, moving forward with innovation. Uh, we had a couple other things we were talking about. Um, <coughs> efficient infringement. Yeah, we talked about terms. Terms, yeah, limited terms. Um, I think that was talked about in the other panel. Time limit and junction, yeah. Uh, I guess it depends on what uh, side of the argument you are. If people are paying or if you're a patent owner, you're the bad guy. And otherwise, you're the good guy. Because it, yeah, it relates a bit to nuance, right? If you, you know, if injunction, if you automatically, if, you know, if, if, all, if all products are, if a patent is a product, then an automatic injunction makes sense. But when you have multi-technology products and you have different types of technologies and you, um, the idea of having an injunction right away can be too strong and not having it all can be too weak and the need for nuance in this, which the system isn't necessarily ready to handle in an easy way. And one of the other last things we were talking about was the uh, Chinese threat galvanized the U.S. if our patent system is perceived as being weaker now. Right. And we all need a we all need a common enemy to, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you don't have a common enemy, you probably need to create one if you want to gather people together. I think one of the last things we're talking about, even VCs are still looking for patents to put money up, right? So patents are still important to. Yeah, when I tried to test funding. them, I, yeah, I said something crazy like, well, I don't think any of the unicorns care about patents. That's not important to them. And then people had almost attacked us there. You had to defend me? Yes, I did. <laughs> right? so. I turned the video off first. Did you before? Yeah. So it's not on the record. Yeah, I shouldn't have said it out yeah. loud now, then. Mm -hmm. But exactly. uh, so everyone was pretty clear that that's not the case. But, but again, there are cases where you know, patents are used in different ways for different people. So it's not necessarily unusual uh, that for some people, patents aren't as important and will not be as important as it is for other people and will have a different. Uh, and, in, and I think that that understanding in which, I think for us to win the, the rhetorical battle, this is my opinion, I guess, is that we have to be able to talk about what is, the, what is intellectual property trying to do and when does sometimes it, it can be bad and when sometimes it can be good. If it's only seen as bad or only seen as good, no one's ever gonna really trust either one of those sources, I think. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to understand when, when it does something that's positive and when it, when it might be too, too much. Now, I think I encapsulated most of our ideas. I was going to ask some of our breakout people if uh, was there any ideas that we did not capture or any threads you wanted to bring up? Are we all good? Well, we got a question? I'm just wondering, you just triggered something. Uh-oh. Whether a balance scorecard, for example, <laughs> might be a good balancing act. Or you know how we now have the dashboards for how we're doing on things. And that might be a way to <laughs> well, I think you have to decide what thing you're going to use for it. Okay, right. six articles here, seven, you know, I don't know. It's a tough crowd. As soon as someone comes up with an idea, we're like, all right, who, want, who owns that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a parking lot issue. I'm giving it. It's out there. <laughs> see, see, had patent troll been marked early on enough, there'd be an infringement issue, and you'd be able to control it. Uh, I see. Let, let's move on uh, hey, to you. Thanks. Th thanks, Bo. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Sure. So um, I'll be very brief here. Um, so we took a very practical approach, uh, for better or for worse. I kind of framed it as uh, what party or what component of government should take the dominant role in uh, making this change or this reform that we've talked about today. Uh, and we broke it out into four, and then we could add whatever else we wanted. So we broke it out into legislative branch, the judiciary, the executive branch, or should it be private companies? And I forced everyone in hopes that there would be a little bit of controversy to pick just one, even though the answer seemed to be everyone said it has to come from all of those components. <laughs> it can't really just be one working versus the other, uh, but it has to be pervasive across all, all of those parties. Uh, and somebody also threw an education also needs to be another component that perhaps all of those different components would also contribute towards. Um, what did come out that was interesting was that 
um, we really felt that to get the fastest uh, and the most uh, efficient results, we'd really have to look towards the executive or the legislative branch. Uh, and specifically with that executive, we wanted to look at the PTO and specifically the PTAB, where we think the most effect could take place the fastest. Um, regarding uh, the legislative branch, the thought was, look, this is really something where we can all, as, as they mentioned, um, uh, find a common enemy here with uh, foreign countries taking the lead. And really, this could be something that, uh, regardless of political affiliation, it could be a bipartisan effort for Congress to get behind and perhaps pass something that would uh, bolster and reform uh, the issues that we've talked about. Uh, regarding the judicial branch, uh, everyone admitted that, look, yeah, typically it takes a long time we have to wait for the right case. That right case has to uh, you know, come up through the appeals process to the Supreme Court so that it can have some, some uh, effect across the, the land. So that likely would take too long. But one way that we can contribute along the way would be through filing of amicus briefs, briefs either through uh, government entities or through private companies or groups of private companies submitting something. And then finally, through the private sector, uh, we, we uh, reiterated what Marshall Phelps had mentioned in the first session about you know, doing something where the board level uh, type training can take place so that CEOs appreciate and the accounting standards are in place so that IP re you know, gets the right uh, level of, uh, of weight that it needs when companies are valued. Um, and then we also talked about education as well and that it's important uh, not only from CEO level but also uh, grassroots type level. We want to educate the children so that they're, as the future comes forward, they also appreciate and understand the importance of IP and that also uh, colleges and et cetera. Uh, just one final parting word is, uh, again, uh, reiteration that uh, injunctions were important and that when they were taken away that IP lost a lot of its, uh, a lot of its bite. Um, and then uh, finally, let's see here. I'm sure I'm missing some stuff, but if anyone in the the orange and uh, the the green group wants to speak up, please uh, raise your hand. The green group. You said that you had to have all the branches working together. It's a good thing we designed the government to be like that. Sure, checks and balances. So they, they all work together, harmon and harmon, Ideally, simultaneously. Right. Yes. <laughs> the private sector is my favorite branch of government. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ashley Keller is uh, standing in or sitting in for um, Gene Quinn, who had a had to catch a flight. So, Ashley Keller. Sure. What I'm a, I'm a poor substitute for Gene, but I'll I'll do my level best. Uh, so we started the conversation with sort of the common laments we have about the sort of state of affairs. And if you saw Gene's live remarks, you know he's really good um, at teasing those out. Um, and so the common themes are we face a formidable challenge because while there are lots of beneficiaries from a strong intellectual property system and there's plenty of money to be made uh, by our side of the ledger, the other side has better economies of scale and is far better organized. So in essence, we face a collective action problem, right? The, the infringement community is really good at spending money on full-time professionals whose only job it is to advocate IP policy that's good for them. They have catchy logos, market testing, you know, the, they have a great message, which is why should you have to pay for something that should be free, which is a really difficult thing to combat. And we are kind of a diffuse group. Uh, we all have lots of human capital and things that we could contribute to the conversation, but we're not well organized. We're certainly not well capitalized. We don't have an army of professionals advocating for our positions. And so that's the sort of sorry state of affairs uh, that we face today. And it's, and it's an uphill challenge, as Gene put it, to surmount. But we wanted to stay true to Bruce's admonition at the beginning of this uh, conference that this is not going to be the same sort of conversation we have at all of these other IP conferences where we talk about the same problems and then we walk away uh, with no solution. So here's our effort at some concrete action items. Uh, first, we sort of divided the world similarly to the green panel, thinking about you know, legislative uh, reform efforts, uh, the judiciary, and the media. Um, and we thought that we could get perhaps the most traction through the media uh, as a way to get the word out. And so um, some remarked that the media today, and you saw this again during the, the discussion uh, specifically focused on the media, that 95% of stories today that the media covers are reactive. They're reacting to news that's been you know, put in the public domain and they have to quickly get something out with perhaps some commentary from those who are expert. And then 5% uh, are stories that are detailed, 
thought pieces, you know, lengthier contributions by experts with you know, more time for the, for the reporter to actually think through the policy ramifications. And so with respect to the 5% of stories, the people in this room should be a resource leaning on the media saying, hey, if you're gonna write a story about intellectual property, yeah, you're gonna talk to the Googles and the Apples of the world and that's fine, but talk to me too. We've got something to contribute. We've got a perspective that's valuable and if you wanna have a balanced piece, you're not gonna be able to do it without talking to people in this room. And so apropos of that, uh, Bruce, something that we've nominated ourselves to put on your plate uh, is creating some sort of list, listserv where when you have information about a media story that's gonna be in that 5%, you sort of send something out to the group. If it's not relevant to you, just hit delete. It's not like you don't hit delete 100 times a day on your phone or on your computer. But if it jumps out at you as something where you have expertise and you can make a valuable contribution, reply back and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer myself to be the person who speaks to the reporter at the journal or the Times or what have you about that piece they're putting together because I've got, I've got a perspective that's worthwhile. Um, and then, sort of a similar concept with respect to the 95% of stories that are more reacting to things that have happened in the world. You know, we're all consumers of information. We see when a big judgment comes out of Marshall, Texas, or when Qualcomm decides to sue Apple, or whatever. Use that as an opportunity, again, on the same list to draw on the human capital in this room to say, hey, I've got a unique perspective on that. I'm frequently litigating in ED Texas, or I'm familiar with that damages issue, or I understand the ramifications of that injunction. And so go out to contacts that we have cultivated in the media so that our side of the story gets out there and it's not just constantly the other side hitting the media up and saying, hey, if you want low prices, stick with us. And if you want to pay more for something that you shouldn't have to, you know, then you can go with the dirty, rotten trolls. We have to be out there and be willing to sort of volunteer <laughs> at least our time, uh, if not our financial resources, to, to combat the problem and hopefully at least as a starting position having some sort of list where this information can be you know, centralized and discussed amongst a group will be better than just us individually trying to go out there and, and make a contribution. On the legislative side, a little bit less optimism uh, that we can accomplish anything, but the idea would be you know, cultivate contacts in the House and Senate. I bet if you pulled this room, we probably do have relationships at least with staffers in 30 Senate offices uh, and you know, ones on relevant committees and, and many more than that in the House. Pay attention to the legislative docket and see when they're holding hearings on some sort of patent related issue and same sort of issue, volunteer uh, to, to put the right sorts of people up as potential witnesses uh, so that you're getting both perspectives. Obviously politicians have an agenda and they, they serve various different masters, not always just we the people of the United States um, but to the extent that we can use our relationships to speak to that group and say, hey, you can't keep calling the same people every time at these hearings uh, and expect to get a balanced policy perspective to set social policy. At least once in a while, throw us a bone and let us get out there. It's another way for us to gain credibility, get the message out. Uh, some people remarked, and I thought this was a good observation, that maybe academics who are on our side uh, could be useful because they seem to approach things or at least have the veneer of approaching things from a more unbiased perspective, not that that ever stops the other side from getting uh, valuable speaking time and slots at these hearings, but you know, thinking strategically about ways that we can sort of uh, get in front of the legislative process, not because we're ever gonna be you know, the number one lobbying group by dollars spent the way Google is, but certainly to have more of a seat at the table and be part of the conversation so that we can change the overall narrative uh, was something we discussed. And then at the tail end of the conversation, we talked about the judiciary, um, and and the, the basic observation is the Federal Circuit is different than every other Court of Appeals in that for every other Court of Appeals, and certainly for the Supreme Court, whenever a vacancy arises, it's you know, a political storm, right? You know, the home state senators go nuts about who's gonna fill those seats and the politics comes into play and are you an originalist or a textualist or you know, an evolving constitution, all of that stuff uh, comes up. It doesn't come up for the Federal Circuit, uh, and that's a, that's a good thing for our purposes, it's a far less politicized court, at least along the traditional lines of politics. And importantly, in this environment in Washington, there's no blue slip that a senator can wield to stop a nominee onto the federal circuit, which at least for now, is not true for the other regional courts of appeals. And so the idea would be, you know, there's only 12, I think, active judges on the federal circuit. Any time a vacancy comes up, this community has to be galvanized and not allow the process to just, you know, uh, have selection along the sort of who's in line to get this slot. 
we as a pro-patent community need to have uh, you know, an active dialogue with anybody we can think of in Washington to try and float some names for that court because we have a much better chance of succeeding uh, for that court of appeals than we would on any other court of appeals because the politics is not as frothy uh, as it would be elsewhere. So that, that was the sum and substance of our conversation and if anybody who was in that discussion uh, see something glaring that I missed, by all means, chime in. I mean, in most of the cases that I read, uh, not necessarily the judges, it comes down to the experts. Most cases are lost because the experts are bad. Oh, there are, there are cases lost because the judges at the yeah. federal circuit are bad. No, no disrespect to uh, yeah. Judge Rader's former colleagues. But. but oftentimes it's the experts. So if you hire bad experts, don't be surprised to get a bad opinion. Ashley Boucher was also called away. So uh, Mariano Munsoy, Munkoy? Munikoy. Munikoy will uh, summarize the, the, uh, the session. He was there. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, I, I was hope. there. <laughs> um, and basically, the main theme uh, during our meeting was having a good and positive IP story. Uh, before I read, my summary of the session, let me tell you that a personal note, I'm an IP lawyer in Argentina, so those of you who are familiar with international IP probably are feeling uh, sad about me or are feeling pity because, you know, IP in Argentina or some other uh, developing countries is not important. Um, and basically, I don't have a good story. I was in this, in this meeting, I was hearing about all these uh, comments. Uh, and I wanted to say and to, to to explain to them the importance of having a, IP, a strong IP system, I can provide you with a, the negative example. In Argentina, I think it's one of a few countries where in 1970s, the number of patent applications filed every year was around 7,000. Uh, these last five years, the number of patent applications filed is around 4,500. So it's the only country where the number of patent files have, has gone down uh, in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, socially, economically, uh, we have other issues. Uh, IP, I'm not saying that IP is the main factor, but I think IP is a very important factor uh, to promote, uh, you know, social benefits. So having a good IP story, as we were discussing in our meeting, I think is very important and very difficult because probably, probably it, it's, it's easier to share a sad story or a negative story rather than a, a, a positive story. But basically, during our meeting, uh, the importance of having and sharing very simple, good, and positive IP stories was pointed out in order to educate the general public on IP and promote its use and the knowledge about its social benefits. These and similar forums should lead the conversation to solve the existing division on many issues within our society, including the social benefits and cost of the IP system. Engaging in this conversation using a simple and positive narrative should influence politicians. And then maybe more so, uh, in a greater detail, leaving aside sophisticated legal language from the central conversation should be based on the fact that the biggest value of IP is realized by the transactions carried out outside the court, as only around 10% of that value is extracted in litigation. Uh, that, I think, is the main uh, topic of our, our meeting. I don't know if there is someone else from the meeting who wants to share something else or some other details. Be free. 